Okay, so uh, I just finished an interview with Nam Baldwin, which was really great. He's an awesome guy. Um, amongst many things, he's the head trainer of Mick Fanning, who's a three times world champ. Um, and Stephanie Gilmore, he's an ex-pro freediver, wrestler, qigong master. He's really nice, really knowledgeable guy. Um, so we talk about all things from reaching your potential to overcoming your fears uh, to everything in between. So I hope you enjoy the interview. So Nam, uh, thank you very much for having us in your beautiful house. And You're welcome. On your, on your property. Um, first, uh, can you give us a brief description of you know, who you are and what you do? Sure. So briefly, uh, I'm a performance. Have to be brief. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a performance coach. So basically, I look after a number of different people, athletes, uh, business people, anyone really, in relation to performance. And performance being being able to do whatever you do better. So I look at the modality of the mind and the body, and bring those two things together, and give people education on how they can be improved collectively to allow you to perform at a higher level. So looking at people's potential and what they do and then allow them to use the tools that I have to improve their performance in whatever that may be. And what are, the, what are some of the modalities that you use um, to reach, help people reach their potential? So a big one is breathing. And uh, I've, me and my partner have developed a breathing program that relates to performance from a sort of a high pressure sort of perspective for example, surfers that go into bigger waves and they're very challenged in terms of how they think and feel when they're under pressure and get them to use their breathing as a sort of a foundation to assist them in good decision making, resetting themselves after a bad wipeout, being able to uh, get their body to perform better in terms of breath hold, etc. Uh, and breathing is, is really the foundation for, for all performance when you really look at it and break it down. Big time. And uh, can that be applied not only to surfers, but can it be applied to a whole range of people trying to increase their performance? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so breathing is, is the basis of how we exist. It's the most important thing that we have to do. And there's levels in which we can do it. And there's levels in which we can sort of tune in and improve upon it so that other parts of us can better their performance. What do I mean by that? Well, if I breathe erratically or shallow, uh, one thing's going to happen straight away is my heart will start to beat a little bit erratically. And that, my heart, is the most important muscle that I have. And if it's under stress or it's not working to its potential, it will send signals up to my brain to say something's not right. And therefore my judgment, my perception changes and how I basically make decisions changes. But it started with my breath being erratic, especially under high pressure or high stress. Yeah. So when we are learning to better our, or make our breath more efficient, what are some things that we can expect to feel or to achieve? So probably to feel, uh, one of the programs that we run, we, we take people through uh, a series of different challenging activities, but then followed by an activity that's very, very calming. So with the breath, we can really establish a very, very calm mindset and a very, very calm nervous system. And that comes across to the person as if they're in a very deep meditative state, but it's not a form of meditation as such. It's a form of breathing and utilizing different sort of uh, mental cues to create such a soft, calm, peaceful environment within a person that then that feeling is it's out of this world in terms of what we normally have, I guess, in day-to-day -day activity. Everything's a bit of a rush. So... We're teaching people to go from a stressed place to a non-stressed place, but the breath is, is the doorway, it's the gate. And when we use the breath effectively, it creates tremendous change in how someone feels. And when you do experience this state of a very calm nervous system or that parasympathetic driven state, can that be carried, can you see a spillover into your day-to-day -day life when you experience that on a regular yeah, basis? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the yeah. big things about that is obviously chemistry changes. So if I have a parasympathetic experience, a calm experience, to have that, there's a series of chemical concoctions going on in my body. In, in particular, my adrenaline will be nice and balanced. My cortisol level, stress hormone will be nice and balanced. Growth hormone will be nice and even where it should be. Uh, and other hormones are in play 
because of that state that I've induced through my breathing. So then that can carry on for, for days. I've had experiences where I've gone and trained people and we've gone very deep into that state. And then for three or four days later, we're, we're both calling each other and going, how good do you feel? <laughs> and you're just so much more centered yeah. and in control of what goes on around you. That's amazing. Uh, do you remember a point in your life where you realized the importance of the breath? Yeah, probably competing in martial arts uh, and fighting. I think fighting, <laughs> to me, was, was a big, big sort of uh, place where I understood that what's going on around me, I can regulate how I feel in response to that. So the stress that I was seeing and how my mind was perceiving it was either making it larger or smaller. But to help me get through to that point where I could regulate what I'm seeing and therefore feeling, I had to use my breathing to calm systems down in my body. So that was a, a really big part. A second big part was, was doing a lot of free diving when I was younger and extending my breath hold to over seven minutes and really working on you know, going deep underwater just because I love the experience of it. But it was again all through the breath. If I got the breathing right and I understood the mechanics of how my body operates, I could take myself to that level of intensity or that level of extremeness, but then be very safe with it. So it was probably a combination of those moments and then other activities, surfing always brings it out. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a sort of a mixture of things going on there. And were they learned to you on more of a visceral level or was it something that you actively sought out and studied as well? Yeah, a bit of both. I had some very good teachers um, when I was younger, I had, had a very, very good martial arts teacher. And from martial arts, a big part of the martial art modality is that you learn to regulate yourself. You know, you learn to regulate your exposure to stress in terms of how you deal with it, in terms of what it means. And breathing was a massive foundation to getting that right. So that was a big part. We've got some little guys joining us. By the way. <laughs> little magpies. Yeah, cool. And what happens to our body when we do enter into a, a very stressed response, be it in the workplace or <laughs> in the surf or any, in any environment? What are some things that happen to our system straight away? Well, straight away your, your nervous system goes into a fight or flight response, which is purely just setting you up ready to, to run from the experience, so to speak, or to fight it. So with that comes chemistry, adrenaline and cortisol in particular, which are really trying to get you into the right state again to deal with the stress that you're about to go through. Now, if we can learn to regulate that, it can be incredibly beneficial because that means that we're more prepared, that means that we can act with a bit more strength uh, and therefore get out of a situation if we have to. But if it becomes too great and it becomes overbearing, it can really shut down uh, another part of us that basically means that the fight, the flight now turns to freeze and we go into to stuck mode, which means if there's a big wave bearing down on you, it's uh, not a good place to be. You want to be able to react, <laughs> not just freeze. So that's where it can take you. So the, the whole idea with some of the things that I'm trying to teach people is to, to learn to regulate it. It's going to happen. It has to. It's natural. And the response to it is just basically to get you into a better place so that you can deal with that situation. So some of the feelings that come with it, well, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get a feeling of excitement of some form. Legs get heavy, you might start to shake. You're, you know, you're, you're really going into wide, you know, eyes are wide open, uh, breathing increases, etc. And it's all part of the parcel. You know, it's part of your body's response to things when it comes to stress. So it's about regulating it. So it's not unnatural or necessarily a bad thing to experience these high levels of stress but it's about how you can deal with it and learn to manage it, is that right? Exactly. Okay. And ideally you're doing training things or activities that take you into this similar experience and whilst you're in that experience, if it's, if it's fairly structured and it's, you know, it's got a, a good way of putting someone there without putting them into too much danger, you can really learn in that moment how to cope with it better, through, especially through breathing. Very simple things that you can take into it that you don't have to think about, but you are taught in the midst of it. And that's potentially what I do is take people to that level and go, right, right now, this is how you're going to breathe. This is how you're going to literally use your eyes. And this is where your thoughts need to be. And that helps build a map within a person's brain that they don't have to think about that can create a nice 
default mode when when they go into stress they go into this experience because they've trained for it and they can then self-regulate without having to do much mm. it just becomes them with athletes that you've trained you've trained a, a very high caliber of athletes from mick fanning stephanie gilmore some olympians as well um what are some commonalities that you find with really high grade athletes when they take on the training that you impart to them into their sport or their realm Probably one of the big thing is they've got a great desire. They really want to do it. They want to get to the top of where they're going to. They have that desire and that hunger. So there's signature behaviors that a lot of them have and that's, that's a big one. They have a very, very strong intent on where they're going. And therefore, when they come across someone that can assist them, they will follow a process, very simple steps to assist them to get to that next level. Uh, so with, with people like Mick, I'll use him as an example, he's, he's probably one of the most self-regulated guys as an athlete and as a person that I've come across due to the stress that he's been through and the way that he's coped with his stresses, which is predominantly from you know, an acceptance that these things can happen and not resisting it, accepting it, that challenges occur, and then using simple tools that he's got from me, he's got from other people, and just basically going with those tools and noticing what works and what doesn't work so that he has uh, a brain and a body that can now tap into them because he's worked with them that then when the stresses happen that form of acceptance allows his body to upgrade to cope better. And um, how do you think adversity shapes an athlete or anybody's life in terms of them dealing with stress and then achieving higher higher rungs? Well, as humans, we have a very powerful uh, concept that we can tap into. It's called choice. Um, and he's basically, if, if we use Mick as an example, he's been through adversity. And when those things happen, when, you know, when the, the calmness comes in or the ability to think clearly comes in after something that's, that's very dramatic, we have a choice. We can either, okay, well, what are we going to do with this? Are we going to grow from this or are we, we going to back down and basically try and drown the feelings and, and suppress them or are we going to go and make something good of this so he he's you know someone like him he's very good at reframing things okay well what's good about this what can I learn from this what can I now do that will get me on a journey towards my visions and my goals and how can I use this incident to create friction more hunger more desire to get where I want to go mm, that's amazing and with people that you see suffering, if they come to you as a client, yes. what are some common roadblocks that you see getting in the way of people's success? Themselves. Um, <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty much their beliefs. beliefs. So their beliefs uh, may be too narrow. They may not be open-minded enough about what's going on. They see the problem. They don't look at solutions. And they get stuck on the problem. So then they don't see what's good about it and they don't see how they can learn from it. So if someone comes with a problem and they're really upset, we've, we've got to go, okay, well, why are you upset? What's it affected? And then what can we learn from that? How can we grow? What tools can we now use to get you on the right path? A big, big part of it is what do you want? And getting that clear in a person's mind because a lot of people aren't really sure what they want, but when, they, when you're really clear on what you're after, then it's just you know, finding someone that can give you the, the, the tools to go, okay, well, if we follow this process and we get little wins along the way, we'll constantly grow towards the vision or the goal that you're after. But we need to know what you want or why something's very upsetting. But from adversity, from challenge, in my mind, there's a gift. And it's just a matter of helping someone find that gift and then giving them the strength and, and very simple tools that they can apply to, to get further towards what they're envisioning in the end. Mm -hmm. That's great. How did you discover what you were passionate about and where you wanted to take your, your knowledge and your dreams? I think, you know, um, meeting people who are like-minded and then surrounding myself by people that, that lift me and have knowledge and have been through experiences and, and bringing them into my experience and, and interacting with them a lot, I found that was, that was a big part is who I hung out with 
uh, those that, you know, at, at a level where I would like to be and quickly I'd get to that level. It'd be like playing a game of tennis. If you play against someone who's really good, you'll lift your level. If you play against someone who's not so good, well, you'll probably drop. So I was, I was conscious of that. And then meeting, meeting my partner, Devo, she's, she's got tremendous wisdom, even though she doesn't think she does. She's got <laughs> tremendous wisdom in, in, in being and, and, you know, enjoying life and figuring out my values early on in life, what I value in life when I was young, due to the people that I surrounded myself by, I got more clarity. So I was very clear on some of the things I wanted to experience and enjoy. And from that, I then realized that if I could teach this to others, I could then enjoy their experience on top of my experience. And now we've got a win-win and it just becomes progressive. Yeah, very rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in today's society and the pace in which we live in, we're all very busy. It's probably something that we can't avoid. Do you see a huge benefit in being and in meditation and those type of practices? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, from a from a uh, very simplistic point of view, your brain is what sort of governs how you perform, how you think, how you behave, and it's got X amount of megabytes. So. This day and age, those megabytes are chewed up a lot by little bits of information that are going on around us. So ideally, we get to a point where we can help the brain and all the little hemispheres within the brain synchronize, and therefore the whole brain become uh, in a rhythmic pattern, brainwave pattern, that allows you to stay more centered and calm, and therefore able to access all areas of the brain. Because when we get stressed, various parts get tied up, and other parts won't work as well. And through meditation, we can create harmony within the brain's way of functioning where its entirety um, goes to a level of good decision making, you know, uh, able to feel things on a very deep level, etc. But that will only come through calming frequencies down that are going on in the brain, which are coming from so much information. So the more that we go into a form of meditation, which is oneness with whatever you're doing, that occurrence happens and now when we come out of a form of meditation we can see things we can feel things we can taste things we can do things on a much higher level because our brain is operating under such a greater potential there's less stress going on and you be able to, your senses become more alive and therefore your thoughts are more alive etc yeah. um if someone's never meditated before what would be just a really easy tip that you could give them that they could apply Yep. Um, right today. Simply, a form of meditation would be to follow your breath on the way in and feel where it goes. And then when you breathe out, just go through the entire body and see if you can soften from your head all the way through to your feet as you breathe out. So every time you breathe in, you just follow it, feel where it goes. Every time you breathe out, you just soften through the body down to your feet. When you soften your body, you'll soften your mind and thoughts will start to drop. And then the idea is that you're going into feeling. You're feeling the air coming into your lungs. You're feeling the air coming out and the body going into a relaxed state. And you can do it for five minutes. You could do it for 10. You could do it for one minute. It doesn't really matter, but that would be a great way to start. Mm. And how about somebody who they might be a weekend warrior in the surf. They might be the next big fanning, or they might be a corporate man trying to succeed in their business. With the work that you do with the breath enhancement training, um, is there any tips that you could give them to just have a little taste of something that they might experience with you? Yeah, probably to, to you know, where we grow is outside of our comfort zone. So to, to go into some form of um, discomfort in whatever you enjoy to do, so push yourself basically a little bit further than what you normally would, but in the process be very, very self-aware of thoughts and feelings that arise from being in that space. And then when you're in that space and something comes up, just acknowledge it for what it is and try and see if you can have a moment or two of pause in that space so that you get to, to know how you react. What do you do? Just become the detective of yourself and go, okay, well, when I'm in this type of stress, this is how I, how I react. I notice that my breathing goes out the window. Okay, well, focus on that and see if you can keep it rhythmic and even. 
Second thing is then my emotions start to really rise and my eyes go really wide. Okay, see if you can go into gazing when you go into that type of stress. See if you can just keep your eyes in a gazing experience and that will help calm your brain down. So simple things like that. Uh, another thing is to just think of your posture when you go into stress. What, what happens to your posture? Do you slump? Do you really rise up? What do you do? See if you can stay centered. Because posture is probably the, 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 the latter part of the fight, flight, freeze posture. Because when we go under stress, our posture changes. So can you stay centered when you're under stress? Uh, that's awesome. Can I ask you, what do you find stressful or challenging? Or what do you feel that you need to, where you've needed to overcome something like that? Like that? Probably, uh, I, I think, it's mm, a good question. What do I find stressful? Um, I, I guess go, going into from a physical perspective I, I think surfing bigger waves stresses me and, and it's it's just that's kind of normal uh, <laughs> but I enjoy the experience at the same time um, how about running a business yeah I, I find that a I guess it's the way I've reframed things. I find it a good challenge. I don't find it, it is stressful, but you know, stress to me is, um, is, is tension. And I guess I'm always working on, on letting that go. So running a business is, is a good challenge. So I, in terms of stress, you know, my immune system, if it gets challenged, I find that stressful and I don't like it to be challenged. So therefore I always try and keep in balance. Um, there isn't much that, that stresses me that I can put my finger on or anything at, at this point. Uh, re relationships that I see other people go through um, makes me uh, really want to assist people more because of, I guess they get so clouded by past uh, behaviors and experiences that they've gone through that then come through if they're not aware of it. So they're, they're working from a child's perspective more than anything. And like that doesn't, it stresses me in the sense that I get stressed for them. I'm like, you don't need to be like this. <laughs> you know, just learn about yourself a bit more and things like this won't happen. So yeah, I kind of jumped around that question, haven't I? I, I don't really yeah, find much things, snakes. I don't like snakes. <laughs> there you go. You're in a great area for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen many. <laughs> That's good. But yeah, not much. Yeah. No, I suppose it's good just to know that um, as a person in service, you're helping other people all the time you've worked, it seems like you've really worked on your own, what you see, what you might have seen as not your strengths. Big wave surfing, you haven't always been a surfer as far as my understanding's gone. When mm. I first met you, you'd just gone over to um, P-Pass and timed yourself, how you can throw yourself under eight foot waves and seeing how long you can get held under mm -hmm. for and those kind of things. So mm. it seems, um, you know, as a person in service, you've always thrown yourself into things that do stress you out. So that you can no longer have them as kinks in your chain. Mm. And, and I think that's, yeah, I that's guess, kind of what I was getting. Yeah, at, yeah, yeah. That. I guess so. You know, it's, um, but I guess it's just the way my brain frames it. It's, mm. it's just good challenges. It is stressful. You're right. You know, and I, and I, when I take, so an example would be, I guess, being stressed in that type of mindset is, is taking on a new group that I don't know. You know, it might be 50 people that I am in front of and I'm taking them through all sorts of emotional changes, etc or ways of thinking and, and believing, and that can be quite stressful. Yeah. But I find it as a good challenge rather than a stress. Yes, it's stressing me, but I find it a good challenge. I just reframe yep. it. So yeah, That's I guess great. that, yeah, there you go. Cool, man. And um, how can we find out, or how can people find out about the work that you do? So yeah, probably just go on onto our website, www.equalize.com.au, um, and there's a series of different things that we do, and uh, you can have a look through it, and go from there cool man well um thanks again for having us at your beautiful property yeah, no worries and uh yeah it's been awesome. great thank you Nick. awesome man. magic good stuff <laughs>